All right, I'm calling now. Hopefully, he'll pick up. Hello? Hello? Hey there. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Do you need me on video? Um, yes, that would be great if you don't mind. Um, but if you don't want to be on video, that's also fine. Happy to be on video. All, All right, right, perfect. Let's do it. All right, okay, let me there just... we go. Is that okay? Pop this out real quick. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's brilliant. Perfect. Uh, let me just also... Uh, I have to do this live. Uh, so, you know, I have to do the production live. So that's one of the one of the unfortunate uh, uh, consequences of that is that, like, I have to figure all this stuff out uh, in real time. But let me, uh, let me just, like, put your... Oh, there it is. It worked perfectly, as a matter of fact. All right. So before we get started with anything, uh, first and foremost, is it Donzinger or Donzinger? Donzinger, right? Donzinger. There's one in. Okay, good. All right. I just, I don't want to mess it up. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you just watched uh, the, the uh, video that we just watched, the world's worst oil-related disaster you've never heard of. And Stephen Donzinger, you are still currently, uh, f after basically for two years, uh, as a human rights lawyer, you were uh, uh, you've served a, a uh, unjustifiable uh, criminal contempt of court house arrest, uh, and you are still under house arrest right now, right? Uh, I, th I believe that they had like taken you off of house arrest uh, and actually sent you to prison. Now you're back. Um, yeah, serving that sentence. I've been. That's that's correct. I've been under house arrest now for almost a thousand days for uh, something that no other lawyer has ever spent a day under detention for in the history of our country. But yeah, I spent 45 days in federal prison, um, another 900 and I've kind of lost count, 30 or 40 uh, in house arrest here in my apartment in Manhattan. Um. So can you walk everyone through, I mean, a lot of people are aware of, of your situation, but can you walk us through exactly what crime you committed uh, to, to get to this situation? Sure. First, I didn't commit a crime, but my <laughs> so-called crime in the eyes of Chevron and the fossil fuel industry was as a human rights lawyer, I think I was a little too successful uh, representing my indigenous and, you know, clients down in the Amazon of Ecuador. We we, we fought for years, myself and other lawyers from Ecuador in the courts down there to win a historic judgment in the amount of $9.5 billion against Chevron. And Chevron tried to criminalize me. Um, they didn't want to pay the judgment. They vowed to fight it until hell froze over and then fight it on the ice. That was the words of their top lawyer. Um, and then they concocted this scheme with the cooperation of two federal judges here in New York to basically detain me um, for protecting the interests of my clients. So, you know, the, the pretextual crime was that I didn't turn over my computer uh, on court order to Chevron. Instead, I appealed the order. And while it was pending appeal, I believe the order was unlawful. Why that unlawful order was being appealed, the judge who, who issued it claimed I committed a crime by not following the order I was appealing. And none of it made any sense. It was clearly an attempt to retaliate against me and my indigenous clients in Ecuador for holding Chevron to account for its massive oil pollution in the rainforest. Yeah. Um, also, there's a little bit of drama leading up to this, uh, to this court case to begin with, right? I mean, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, originally uh, there was attempts to criminally prosecute you. Uh, which, of course, uh, no one was willing to take because it's a ridiculous. Uh, it would have been a ridiculous court case for the criminal justice system to take on. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, there was basically a sidelining of that and and uh, the hiring of a judge to to uh, try you in civil court. That that's true, and that's an extremely important point. Um, I've never been prosecuted criminally or charged with a crime by a normal prosecutorial entity that is, you know, government prosecutor's office. The only people who have accused me of a crime are the people at Chevron who I helped defeat in court in a crushing historic victory uh, down in Ecuador. And they claim that I committed fraud and they paid a witness to claim, you know, I did some bad things, totally false. 
and they you know took that into a u.s judge who's a former tobacco lawyer his name is lewis kaplan um and he just you know tried to steamroll me without a jury uh and then after that he tried to prosecute get me prosecuted for refusing to, to turn my computer over to chevron which is preposterous order it would be unethical for me to do so um that case the u.s attorney's office refused to take it so the judge appointed a private chevron law firm to prosecute me directly and i have to say of all the things that have happened to me there's so many regular things this i think is the most terrifying i was basically prosecuted and deprived of my liberty by a chevron lawyer in the name of the u.s government that's never happened before in our history yeah. And if this can happen to you, this can happen to technically anyone that is a, uh, an attorney that's on the side of justice or fighting for, for civil rights, civil liberties, uh, anyone that goes against a mega corporation. Uh, this is basically establishing a template for how you can continuously uh, sue people and even jail them unjustifiably. Um, what would you say is... Uh, one of the reasons, I mean, what would you what would you say to the lack of mainstream media coverage in this in this process? Do you feel like it's been adequate? Do you feel like people have talked about this at all? I mean, I uh, originally knew about this specifically from the Chapo interviews. Like, I I personally was and and Democracy Now as well. So I I personally have only heard about your uh, case, uh, despite it being in you know completely unjustifiable and a stain mm -hmm. on the supposedly infallible uh, American criminal justice system, the institutions. I've only heard about it from independent media outlets. Why do you think that's the case? Well, you know, as you know, I'm sure better than most, it's, it's hard to get big media to cover certain topics in America. Um, when indigenous people beat the heck out of a big American oil company in a foreign court, um, you know, they, they're just not covering it. I can't explain it. I mean... We have personally pitched seven different reporters at the New York Times, and every single one was interested. And then, like, it, they'd kick it upstairs, and the, the story would be killed, including one extremely well-known writer who worked two weeks on a story for the magazine before it was killed. I mean, I will point out that Chevron's, uh, you know, I'm sorry, the lead lawyer of the New York Times on media affairs is the same lawyer the Gibson Dunn law firm paid by Chevron to detain me. So there's a total conflict of interest at the newspaper. But of course, that doesn't explain the power of the fossil fuel industry and their ad dollars to control news coverage at some of the main networks like CNN or MSNBC, you know, which also really haven't covered this. But to the credit of the independent media, people like yourself, Marianne Williamson, Katie Halper, Crystal Ball, I mean, there's so many people, Will Meneker, the Chapo guys, have covered this and they really have spread the word such that our narrative has gotten out there in a very big way and and you know it's reached millions and millions of people so you know you don't need those big media companies anymore to get your story out like you did prior to the internet so i'm appreciative to you and others who really create these platforms where people like me can actually tell our stories yeah um Amnesty International uh, uh, has uh, talked about this before as well with the over 100 environmental and human rights organizations joining Amnesty International's call for Biden to pardon you. Um, yeah. I, I don't even fully understand how that works, considering that you are not, you know, you're in criminal <laughs> contempt of court, but you're not being charged by the American criminal justice system. So I don't even know what kind of like federal jurisdiction that falls under. Um, well, yeah. Just so you know, I mean, it's so weird to ask for a pardon when you didn't do anything. Okay? Yeah. So I want to start by saying that. But what we have figured out on our team or have decided is that the judges here, at least in New York, who have control of my case are, you know, completely pro Chevron. I mean, I feel like I cannot get a fair hearing. I've never had a jury. I've never been charged criminally yet. I'm detained now for almost a thousand days on a misdemeanor. I mean, the whole thing is crazy. So we asked Merritt Garland, who's the attorney general, to take the case out of the hands of the private Chevron law firm and prosecute me directly. That is, if there's something really there, let's do a normal prosecution. And he has refused to do that, which really is disturbing. So we're like, let's just go to Biden and force the issue with Biden because, you know, he claims he's, he's dealing with the climate issue. Well, you know, you can't deal with the climate issue adequately when a human rights lawyer who's a frontline earth defender is being locked up in your own country. So we're pushing Biden to issue a pardon and end this charade once and for all. 
Amnesty International has gotten the support of 120 Wait, different human rights um, and about hello? organizations. I just lost oh, you. Yeah. I, I just lost oh. your uh, uh, audio for a second. You said we're pushing Biden to end the charade once and for all. Yeah, and then I and then I was saying that 120 different human rights and environmental organizations have joined Amnesty International's call for a pardon. Biden needs to step up and fix this problem because clearly the judges in New York, you know, won't adjudicate the case in any kind of normal and fair way. So we are asking the President Biden to deal with this and we are building support. By the way, we're asking everyone to sign the pardon letter, which was signed by 10 attorneys. And you can do that on our website at freedonziger.com. Absolutely. Um, now you mentioned Biden potentially stepping in. However, uh, also, uh, as you have uh, talked about before, uh, more than 200 justice groups are rejecting the Biden nominee and Chevron lawyer Jennifer Reardon as a lifetime federal judge. Reardon was one of the uh, uh, lawyers that helped Chevron jail you and cover up its toxic poisoning of the Amazon. Um, so it does seem like their interests lie elsewhere in defending uh, the, the, the corporate structure. Well, I want people to really sort of think about how bad this is for a second. Okay, the judge you just, or the lawyer you just mentioned, Jennifer Reardon, is a Chevron law, lawyer at a, at a private law firm that financed the criminal prosecution of me. Why is she being nominated by Joe Biden to the federal bench? Not only to the bench, but to the very same court where Judge Kaplan sits. Judge Kaplan and Judge Preska locked me up. They've kept me locked. Oh, at the behest of Chevron and its law firm, Gibson Dunn. So now we're going to have another judge on the same court from the Gibson Dunn law firm. You know, it's kind of funny. You never really see human rights lawyers become judges. They always seem to be these corporate defense lawyers. And, you know, my opinion, they rigged the system against human rights victims like those in Ecuador, especially when they come into U.S. courts. So, you know, I think it's wrong. I think it's outrageous, actually for the United States Senate, for the Democrats, for Biden to be pushing onto the federal bench, someone who has represented Chevron, attacked the Amazon, helped Chevron destroy the Amazon, attacked indigenous peoples and jailed me. That's not, that person just uh, is unfit to serve as a federal judge in my opinion. Um, no, absolutely. Uh, do you think, so how much, how much money has been paid to the victims thus far out of the $9.5 billion that, uh, that was successfully sued, that you uh, successfully sued uh, uh, this company for? Zero. <laughs> so not, not a single dollar has been paid off so far. Chevron planted some trees in the median of a highway in Ecuador's capital of Quito. That's about all they've done. They have never paid the judgment. They have not only not paid it, they vowed to never pay it. Um, they forced the indigenous peoples to chase their assets around the world, and they just mock them. I mean, you know, they also have paid, this is very important, they paid a couple of billion dollars at least in fees to pay 60 law firms and 2,000 lawyers to attack me and to attack other lawyers who held them accountable through this case. So they're paying money even big money. They're just paying it to law firms to beat the hell out of the indigenous peoples rather than to comply with the court order that they clean up their poison in the Amazon. Have they cleaned up that uh, uh, poison in the Amazon at all? Or have they made any efforts to even clean that up? No. I mean, um, they, they, claim, they claim they have. They have, they have these open air waste pits. And I want people to understand, I guess people saw the vice video, but there's a thousand of those waste pits that they dug out of the jungle floor, didn't line them. They put pits into the sides to run the cancer causing waste into rivers and streams that people were drinking out of, you know, causing a massive epidemic of cancer. I mean, hundreds, thousands of people have cancer. So many have died and they just left it there. And then in the 1990s, after we initially sued them, they covered a few of the pits up with dirt to hide them as if that was, as, as if that was some form of cleanup. And it, what it really did is it made the problem worse. It's sort of like treating cancer with a Band-Aid. And it just doesn't come close to fixing the problem. And these, there's a thousand pits down there that, that were built by Texaco, now Chevron, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s that are still polluting the jungle, still polluting the groundwater. They still have the pipes running into rivers and streams. And they're poisoning people. And I'll point out one important thing here. Like, this was not an accident. 
Okay, this was not an oil catastrophe that was a result of two ships colliding or, or you know, a, a blowout that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Oh, no, this was planned. Okay, this was a deliberate engineering design to run billions of gallons of cancer-causing oil waste into the rainforest, onto the ancestral lands of indigenous peoples as a cost-saving measure by Chevron. I mean, it was just so, so wrong, and I would argue it's criminal. Absolutely. I mean, it, it literally is criminal. Um, yeah. Uh, but, uh, of course, obviously they have enough power to not only uh, not go to jail for these sorts of crimes, crimes against humanity, but also they can even refuse to pay. Uh, they can even refuse to pay the victims and, and not even clean it up. Um, so what kind of recourse is out there? What kind of international mechanisms are out there to potentially force uh, Chevron's hand into paying uh, the victims, the, their, you know, they, the, the dollar mm -hmm. amount that they won rightfully in court? Well, luckily for the Ecuadorians, there's a lot of avenues where they can force Chevron to pay. I mean, part of our issue is resources, and part of it is they detained me, and I was sort of the driving force behind a lot of these efforts, and I haven't been able to travel. They took my passport, by the way, um, and I've been stuck here now for almost three years. But basically, the the communities in Ecuador that won the judgment have the right to go collect the judgment forcibly by suing Chevron wherever they have assets in any country in the world. Chevron has assets in dozens and dozens of countries around the world. I mean, it's a very wealthy company. And there are lawyers, as I understand it, helping the Ecuadorians decide where they're going to file um, enforcement actions in other countries to, if necessary, seize the company's assets such that they're forced to comply with the court order that they clean up their toxic waste that they left down in Ecuador. Um, so it's really these judgment enforcement mechanisms in the courts of countries where Chevron has assets is the easiest and most effective way to force Chevron to pay up. Um, I've been ordered, by the way, by Judge Kaplan that to not participate in any of those activities, and I'm not because of that order. Um, but the Ecuadorians and council have a right to advocate for themselves. And my understanding is they plan to do just that. Um, do you feel like this, your, uh, your current predicament uh, being unjustifiably uh, uh, held uh, in contempt of court uh, for a thousand days under in-house arrest, do you feel like this is uh, a way to stop other lawyers such as yourself, just like yourself, from going out and, and fighting for uh, indigenous people? Do you feel like this is a, you know, a, a threatening posture, deliberately created the situation, the scenario deliberately created to showcase that like, hey, look, if you go against us, uh, it doesn't matter if you are in the right, we will fuck up your life permanently. Absolutely. I mean, um, I mean, I think Chevron is trying to turn me into a vehicle to intimidate other lawyers and human rights activists and environmental justice campaigners all over the world. I mean, they want me to be exhibit A when young people think, well, do I want to go into this field? Do I want to do the hard work to defend the earth, to defend our planet, to save our planet from global warming? Well, look what happened to Stephen Donzig. But what I really try to emphasize, and I think this is really, really important, is this is happening because we are, have been successful. OK, we won the case. They didn't win. We won. And the judgment in Ecuador is invalidated by six different appellate courts, including the Supreme Courts of Ecuador and Canada. There's only one trial judge in the U.S. who has tried to undermine the judgment, this Judge Kaplan, by attacking me um, and depriving the Ecuadorians of their lead lawyer. You know, he's, he's really trying to get me to quit the case such that the Chevron's victims will be defenseless and will be unable to continue to pursue their legal claims. So, you know, I don't want people to get demoralized. Yes, they're trying to intimidate others through my example, but you know what? Look at my example. You know, there's a way people can get inspired to do the work by seeing how successful you can be at a grand scale such that you can really change the paradigm of an entire industry. I mean, understand this case is intimately connected to the destruction of the planet, to global warming. Like if you can't do legal work 
to hold the major polluters accountable, what chance do we really have of saving our planet from this crisis? You know, so I see the fact they're locking me up and, you know, the, the naked and what I would argue are corrupt means that they're doing so is proof positive that we're successful and that they feel tremendous fear. They're terrified, actually, of people like me and others who do this work. You know, otherwise, why would they have to resort to such measures? Yeah. But, you know, the, the story is still being written and, you know, we'll see how it ends up. I, we won. I feel fabulous about the future, by the way. My, my sentence ends on the 25th of April, which is less than three weeks. And we'll see where we go from there. I'm not the only lawyer working on the case. There's tons of other lawyers. It's not my case. I don't even, I don't own the case. It's owned by the people of Ecuador. And they have a lot of legal representation. And Chevron's in for a real battle. They're facing major financial risk. What are the next steps after this, after your, uh, you know, criminal contempt of court is, is, uh, is done. Your sentence is over, even though, you know, it's so weird saying that it's a sentence or criminal contempt. of court. I know. It, It's a ridiculous situation. Um, I know. Sorry for that noise. What I was going to say is that the, the next thing um, is I'm going to still really do two parallel tracks. I mean, one is I'm going to fight for my exoneration. Like I don't want them to get away with this. So that includes an appeal which is still pending of my so-called conviction, by the way, by Judge Preska, who's a member of the Federalist Society. That was my judge. Chevron funds the Federalist Society. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, she was reading the newspaper during witness testimony, denied me a jury and denied me the right to present a defense. I mean, I, you know, the, the whole trial was a joke. It was a farce. They can't so we'll add see... additional, right? Sorry to cut you off, but they can't. Can they like can they continue adding additional like extend the date of the criminal contempt of court here or well no i mean once my sentence ends that's over but it won't prevent them from trying to go after me in other ways you know i hope they don't i mean if they do i will fight it um and you know and the other thing is the pardon i mean president biden and merrick garland the attorney general of the united states need to stop this the first private corporate prosecution in U.S. history. It violates the rule of law. Why would Merrick Garland, who's supposedly this person who's independent and upholds the law, you know, restoring independence to the Department of Justice, why would he be that person while at the same time letting Chevron prosecute its lead critic in a so-called criminal prosecution in the name of the U.S. government. I mean, this is an embarrassment for our country. The United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention has already determined my, my detention is illegal. They've ordered my immediate release. So this is an, becoming more and more of an embarrassment uh, for Biden and his foreign policy. So, you know, we're hoping to get through the courts. I don't have a ton of confidence because the courts have so favored Chevron and really haven't given me any, anything close to a fair hearing up to this point in the United States. But we're still hoping to get relief because this is so egregious, you know, it's so flagrant. And then also a pardon from Biden. And then apart from that, I plan to do a lot of human rights work generally around the world. I've been asked to talk about lots of different issues beyond Ecuador, and I plan to continue my human rights work. Um, one of the details that you kind of that you also mentioned that I think is good for people to know is that Judge Kaplan allowed Chevron to present secret and anonymous witnesses who could not effectively be cross-examined due to the purported security threats, according to the report. You know, just like they said originally that, you know, there was judges in the pocket of the big indigenous, as though, like, there is some sort of coalition there with any sort of uh, security or, or money. Um, uh, and then also that Judge K, in addition, allowed Chevron to present a witness who conceded that the company was paying him a monthly stipend 20 times his former salary. So one of the witnesses, uh, secret witnesses, literally got paid a monthly stipend 20 times more than their former salary. Um, you know, I, I wonder if the corrupt side in the circumstances, those who are fighting for the indigenous uh, population and, and their safety and security or uh, the mega corporation backed judges uh, that have you know allowed these incredible uh, erosions of the law to uh, occur here um yeah it's, go ahead sorry yeah it's pretty amazing i mean chevron's star witness against me who just 
baldly lied in court. You know, they paid him $2 million plus dollars um, total. They moved him and his family up from Ecuador. He claimed he was in a meeting where he saw me approve the offering of a bribe to the trial judge. This is total bullshit. I mean, it just did not happen. And there was no evidence to support what he said. Zero evidence. And he later admitted lying in a, in a under oath in a separate arbitration proceeding like a year later. But Judge Kaplan continues to insist that this is a valid judicial finding. And on that basis, I was disbarred without a hearing on the theory that I bribed a judge. By the way, if I really bribed a judge, indict me criminally and try me. OK, I'm telling that to the U.S. attorney. But of course, Chevron tried to get that to happen and they wouldn't do it because there's no evidence. So yeah. why is Chevron always using these tricks and maneuvers through civil court to try to criminalize me? And they'll only take their case to one judge who's a f former tobacco lawyer who obviously has deep hostility toward me. I mean, it's, it's really an embarrassment. It's becoming increasingly obvious to everyone around the world. And the United Nations Working Group, by the way, that's five respected jurists that looked at the record in this criminal contempt case, said they were appalled. That's the word they used, appalled by this staggering, in other words, this staggering level of judicial impropriety in my case. And these are U.S. federal judges. So, yeah. you know, look, we have a more serious problem in this country, which is our, a lot of our federal judges have gone extreme to the extreme right wing edge of the political spectrum. Under Trump, you know, that was that process of getting those types of judges onto the federal bench was deeply accelerated. It's amazing how people like Trump appoint extreme right wing judges, people like Biden and Obama appoint centrist judges, and they yeah. act like it's some sort of balance, you know, but the courts are increasingly dominated by pro corporate judges. Um, it's very hard to get a fair hearing when you're a human rights lawyer at this point. And I've been I've been victimized by this trend, although I will say, you know, the vast, vast majority of judges in America, even if they're right wing, like at least try to adhere to the rule of law to the best of their ability. <laughs> These two judges, I think, went totally over the edge to try to manipulate the law to destroy the life of a human rights lawyer. And that's different. Yeah. And I mean, a reminder to those in the chat who are watching right now that this is the very same Supreme Court that also threw out a lawsuit accusing Cargill Inc. and Nestle, uh, a subsidiary of knowingly helping perpetuate slavery at the Ivory Coast cocoa farms, which they absolutely did. Um because they were uh, basically third-party vendors that were utilizing uh, child slavery uh, at the cocoa farms, so they were not morally culpable or accountable for that. I mean, I'm I'm describing it in like really reductive terms. I don't know if you want to uh, put any sort I mean, of feedback that, towards that, but that's a great example of how our courts are just completely hostile to human rights claims of people from other countries who are victimized by U.S. companies. Yeah. I mean, it's just the most extraordinary thing. It's like U.S. companies are being given immunity, essentially immunity, to go to other countries and kick the shit out of people and never be held legally accountable because they create these doctrines about, hey, you have to have contact with the U.S. to sue, even though, you know, like in the case of Ecuador, all the planning to poison the Amazon was done in the United States at Texaco headquarters here in New York. But, oh, no, you know, it's not close enough to Ecuador to do the case here. There's always these mechanisms that um, judges have to get rid of these claims. And they try to act like they're applying these rules. But in reality, it's very subjective and it's driven, I think, largely by politics and by the need by our court system to protect the wealth of corporations, U.S. corporations that really commit serious abuses in other countries, as, as Chevron has done in Ecuador, and by the way, in many other countries as well. Yeah. I mean, this is before we even get into, uh, I mean, there's also other things that they keep doing, like, uh, I don't know, uh, utilizing the State Department to create conflict in areas, uh, or, or even when uh, they have Know, nationalization of oil refineries or oil industries or extraction industries in general. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, great opportunity for a right wing coup d'etat to immediately take over the country, even if it fails. Um, obviously. Yeah I, I, yeah. I mean, my experience is Chevron and a lot of these big oil companies prefer an, an environment where governments are corrupt. It becomes more efficient. Governments are willing to deploy the army to shoot their people when they protest pollution. 
governments who will take payoffs to give them, you know, no bid contracts. I mean, they like that. It makes it easier and more efficient than to actually play by real rules. And I'll also add that in my experience in Ecuador, and I've been, I've been there, by the way, over 250 times, the U.S. State Department via our embassy in Quito it was like an outpost for Chevron. I mean, Chevron would just float in there and get them to pr try to pressure the Ecuador government to kill our case. Chevron had easy access to the ambassador whenever they wanted it. You know, they, they tried to make um, the fact that Ecuadorians were suing a U.S. company some sort of foreign policy problem for the U.S. government, where they would put it on, you know, on the agenda for their bilateral trade talks. I mean, it was awful the way oil, big oil, had the power to essentially, you know, shoehorn U.S. foreign policy in such a way that it would serve their needs, their private needs, rather than promoting democracy, rule of law, and human rights, which is the professed purpose of U.S. foreign policy. Of course, we know they fall way short of that. But it was just amazing the power Chevron had to control U.S. foreign policy in Ecuador. Yeah. Uh, let's not forget that this is also the country that uh, has openly stated in its own, uh, you know, in its own, uh, with its own legislation that they will quite literally invade the Hague if uh, any sort of uh, U.S. service member is ever uh, prosecuted or extradited uh, to be tried in the International Criminal Court for any kind of war crimes that they uh, may have engaged in. So uh, that's, uh, you know, that's how we think here in the United States about the international rule of law or, uh, or any number of different treaties or whatever we have, uh, suggestions, conventions. They're all just, uh, they're, none, they're nothing. We are the global hegemonic dominant power, and our government unfortunately works at the behest of the corporations and the corporate profit, uh, rather than uh, you know places the emphasis on the security of human beings all around the world. Um, uh, Stephen, I don't want to take up too much of your time, uh, but uh, I wanted to hear more about you know what you're looking forward to in the future now that you're going to be a free man soon, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um. Um, well, you know, this has been quite the ordeal. I mean, I literally have been in my house now for almost a thousand days, unable to even go out to dinner, travel, you know, I get out on occasion with passes to do like legal meetings or, you know, very limited doctor's appointments, but pretty much here all the time. So look, I'm looking forward to resting for a few months. Um, I want to write this story, um, in the form of a book and you know reflect on what's happened i i really feel empowered oddly enough by having been detained i mean you know the support that i and my clients down in ecuador received just was something i didn't expect to happen to the extent that it did I mean, we have 68 nobel laureates who've issued statements dozens of bar associations around the world 11 congresspersons thousands and thousands of citizens have joined our campaign by the way for those who want to help please go to free donziger.com website yeah we'll be we'll uh, be spamming that i think uh originally they might have broken the website a little bit when we when you first mentioned it yeah there's a lot of people in here watching um oh okay. no it's, it's working now okay and and by the way um we have a donate button. I don't really like pitching for money, but if people can even give a little bit, we have massive legal costs to deal with these monsters. So, you know, we have thousands, the way we make this work, because it costs a lot of money to deal with Chevron. Look, we pay a penny on the dollar compared to what they pay, but we need money. And we rely on thousands of people around the world to give small amounts of money. It's sort of the Bernie Sanders fundraising model. Yeah. And so if you can, if you can give a little, please do. If you can't, don't worry about it. Give us your email anyway, and you'll get updates on the case. Again, it's freedomziger.com. But, you know, what we're trying to do writ large is take this movement for my freedom and for justice for the people of Ecuador and build it into something bigger, really build it into a campaign um, for global justice through human rights, law, and climate. I mean, you know, these types of cases are so important to all of us. And, you know, a lot of people don't know how much power judges have to block lawyers from doing the important frontline earth defense work. People like me, people like Pablo Fajardo, who's an Ecuadorian lawyer, Julio Prieto and others. We need to be able to do this work. There's a lot of people trying to do the work around the world, and we cannot live in a society if we're to save our planet. 
where any government, um, particularly a government that professes to support the rule of law, like the United States, is able to lock up its human rights lawyers. I mean, we can't let this happen again. So help us. I mean, our campaign is to hold corporate polluters accountable and to prevent advocates from being attacked and jailed like this, such that this work can get done. So again, it's freedonziger.com. And I'll say I'm really optimistic about the future. I mean, you're like, you're crazy. Like you have the optimism virus. I mean, you know, I understand how history and social change evolves dialectically, right? Like you're successful, they're gonna push back. You get to a higher level, then they push back harder. And, you know, we've been able to elevate this whole battle um, to a place where we never imagined it could ever get to when we started many, many years ago. So, you know, we're going to get it even higher. More people are going to know about it. And we're going to strengthen the hands of all citizens to do this work such that we can really gain control of our planet or at least try to over this very powerful fossil fuel industry. Absolutely. Um, I'm not usually a very uh, optimistic person, but, you know, talking to you, I, I, I get a little bit more confidence in that on that front. Um, what other calls to action do you have for the people here right now other than uh, donations, which are uh, valuable, of course, um, uh, at freedonzinger.com? You also have uh, calling, for example, uh, Merrick Garland's uh, office, Attorney General Garland's office, uh, and, and pressing option two. Demand U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland and the DOJ and the nation's first corporate prosecution. Um, uh, is there anything else that's uh, uh, important yeah. for uh, us to focus our efforts on? Absolutely. So there's, you know, support the campaign, um, call Merrick Garland, sign on to our pardon letter to Biden. We have, I don't know, somewhere between five and 10,000 signatures. We, we'd like to get that up much higher. So on the Free Donziger website, there's a button. You can say sign the letter. So please sign the letter. Um, you know, we want to keep getting that letter stronger and stronger. And we're just going to keep pushing it. I mean, there's no statute of limitations. I mean, my sentence is going to end on April 25th. Beyond that, we're going to keep fighting for this if it takes years. I mean, this is going to be an organizing vehicle as well for the movement. And the final thing I'd like to add is, um, you know, my sentence ends April 25th. I, for those who live in New York City area, come by um, to 104th Street between West End and Broadway. A bunch of musicians are going to come that afternoon at four o'clock. Uh, we're going to have a little music festival um, to celebrate the end of my sentence and to talk about the future. So everyone's invited. It's, uh, it's 104th Street, Manhattan, between West End and Broadway four o'clock on april 25th um we have a permit we're gonna have try to have some fun hell yeah all right well thank you so much for all of the wonderful work that you've done all the brave work that you've done and thank you for coming on to uh explain uh your plight the plight of uh, the people that you've defended and fought for um this was this was awesome Thank you for having me, and I salute you for what you do. And oh, no, I'm nothing. I'm 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 just a shit poster, man. I don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. A lot of issues that are important, and from my perspective, someone who's been you know, the big media has tried to silence me. To be able to go to people who've built, done the hard work to build these kinds of platforms is really important. So I I salute you, my friend, for what you've done. So thank you for that. All right, thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay, you too. All right, folks. That was Stephen Donzinger, a human rights lawyer, unjustifiably held in contempt of court for almost a thousand days. Uh, he also served 45 days in prison as well. Um, completely. Donzinger, I'm saying it right. Okay, everybody shut up. I'm Turkish. I'm Turkish. You know this. Um, that was a, a brilliant interview. I mean, he's awesome. And, uh, and you know, he, you can see uh, his work on free Uh, we're going to move on to some other stuff. Yes. This interview will be recorded and posted on, uh, my YouTube account, uh, as well. So 